Hello, I'm State Senator Susan Moran. On today's episode of In Your Corner, we'll be talking about the state fiscal year 2023 budget, which is in the works as I speak. I filed 33 amendments that address child care inadequacies, mental health needs, whole tech safety measures, and other local priorities that will have a meaningful impact to the residents of Plymouth and Barnstable District. In this segment, we'll be discussing the budget process and advocacy work by local groups. Let's get started here on In Your Corner. The annual state budget is where the legislature makes decisions on how revenue will be distributed to the state and locally. The budget is developed through a multi-stage process that involves deliberation from all three branches of government. The legislature convenes in two-year sessions. In January of each year, the governor publishes the administration's proposal for the next fiscal year. This year, Governor Baker filed a $36 billion budget, which may sound like a lot, but actually it gets broken down pretty easily when talking about all of the resources that we need to rely on for state funding to function. Here, we have the general outline of the budgetary process. As you can see, following the release of the governor's budget, both the House and the Senate are responsible for developing their own proposals through intensive solicitation of public input from residents and advocacy groups. The Senate will be taking up our budget this week with tax revenue estimates looking optimistic. The $49.7 billion proposal outlines meaningful investments in early education and child care, K through 12 schools, mental health and substance abuse, housing and resources for individuals and families in deep poverty. Members will file amendments on their respective versions based on their district specific needs. Once the House and Senate have finalized their proposal, a conference committee of selected members from both branches will come together to negotiate final language, which is then voted on by the legislature and sent to the governor's desk for approval or for veto. The goal is to have the budget in place well in advance of the beginning of the new fiscal year, which is July 1st. That's why members begin seeking public input months in advance. Amendments can come in the form of local earmarks, requests, for targeted to a specific organization or municipality, statewide or regional requests are often used to request funding for an existing budget item or allocate money to a statewide priority, or language changes that may add a new stipulation or clarification to the use of specific funds. There are also usually outside sections where language can be included that's not specific to the budget. These sections are typically policy changes. Public input is an important aspect of the annual state budget process. I meet with local advocates and stakeholders, which allows me to get a better understanding of what the needs of the district are and helps align my legislative and budget priorities with those of the people I represent. In this year's budget, I'll be advocating for strong funding to stimulate our regional economy, to support our human service transportation services, and to develop new STEM learning opportunities for our K-12 students. I'm also looking to secure money for the Plymouth Council on Aging, Plymouth Veterans, and upgrades to the Plymouth Fire Department communication systems, 
and increase funding for safety measures and oversight at Holtec. I'm hopeful that this presentation illustrated how the budget comes together and will inform your own advocacy on the issues that are important to you and your community. The slideshow, along with additional information on this year's budget and budgets past, can be found on my website, www.SenatorSusanMoran.com. Up next, I'll be joined in studio by Lisa Spencer, CEO of South Shore Community Action Council. Stay tuned. As I mentioned, a legislator is only as strong as the local partners they have. I'm so glad to be joined today by one of those partners. Lisa Spencer, CEO of the South Shore Community Action Council. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you, Senator Moran. Uh, I'm so happy you're here and you've been working really hard. I wonder if we could start by just um, kind of getting a flavor of your background and then the position that you have now and what you're doing. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I've been with South Shore Community Action Council in a variety of positions um, for a good number of years. Um, I started as the agency planner there and um, quickly became involved in the energy programs. Um, uh, I was the director of the fuel assistance program and then added the energy conservations to that, um, became the director of energy programs. Um, and then most recently, over the last um, probably six years or so, uh, I became the deputy director of the agency. So um, I became much more involved in all the programs that South Shore Community Action Councils administers. And tell me, uh, you know, just big picture, you serve as, as the agency low-income families on the South Shore and provide a wide range of financial services and educational resources to our most vulnerable residents, including, um, you know, folks who have various challenges. Um, is, give me a, an idea of the population. Well, our, the program with the largest uh, geography uh, that we uh, administer is the fuel assistance program. Mm -hmm. um, fuel assistance covers 39 towns uh, from Hull south to Wareham, as well as the Cape and Islands. Um, so, other programs that we administer have a much more limited geography. Uh, our child care programs, um, we do have uh, three locations on the Cape, one in Wareham, um, and one in Plymouth, and one in Marshfield, and predominantly serve South Shore households and Wareham households. We do have um, uh, probably about a hundred or so households on the Cape that we provide child care services to as well. Wow. Um, we have a large transportation program and we have clients throughout the South Shore uh, as far west as the Attleboro's. Wow, so for transportation is that uh, directed for example to medical appointments or what's the practical aspect? It's um, almost exclusively medical appointments. Um, Clients are uh, selected by agencies such as Old Colony Elder Services, uh, South Shore Elder Services, and we're, um, we transport disabled and elderly clients. Um, we have about um, 30 transportation uh, vehicles, all are wheelchair accessible, and all our right. drivers are, are trained to, um, to work with those special clients. That, so. That's huge. I mean, whether um, you've been dealing with a handicap for a while or whether, for example, you're under a specific medical treatment mm -hmm. that might require temporary wheelchair accessibility, that's such a spe uh, specialty and so appreciated. What, um, you know, in, in terms of um, your relationships with um, how you contract 
to benefit your clients. Do you have, um, you know, it, it, it would be elderly services, and who are your referral um, agencies generally? It would be uh, South Shore Elder Services. So those folks, do they pre-qualify? Yes, they do all the eligibility. Old Colony Elder Services and South Shore Elder Services do the eligibility for the program, and um, the funding is then then goes through MART and GATRA, um, funding coming from Executive Office of Health and Human Services, um, specifically the HST, Human Service Transportation Program. Um, so that's where our, um, those are the partners that are involved with our transportation program. It's so interesting to me to hear about the implementation of, of how folks are served because working on the Senate HST side and trying to fund the operations and, and really um, lobby our, my fellow senators for how crucial this is, this is, you know, something that, you know, I, I would imagine during um, so COVID must have um, been perhaps even a bigger need. Um, and, but I'm, I'm kind of interested in what you experienced as an agency going from before COVID really hit till when we were sort of in the dregs of COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID had uh, such a dramatic impact for an agency that um, primarily serves clients in person. Um, the service, service pivots that we had to implement were um, pretty much across the board. Um, so childcare uh, programs were shut down for a brief period until uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts allowed um, reopening with appropriate um, PPE and social distancing and even, um, you know, uh, limiting the number of children on a bus, right, for, for oh, example. Those sort of practical considerations, right. wow. Right. Um, transportation, um, we initially had to furlough drivers because um, that was another, uh, you know, uh, response to what was happening and the uncertainty of how we were going to transport clients safely. Um, as uh, PPE became available and um, guidance came out in terms of um, uh, being able to limit the number of individuals you could transport in a van, um, you know, that service uh, gradually came back. I can't even imagine the client service numbers of questions people must have been worried I, how did you you know can you think of examples of calls you got or questions that you got the calls and questions were uh, certainly certainly nonstop um, you know and it really depended on the program the particular program um, I haven't addressed our food distribution center yet. Um, we have a large um, food distribution center in our building at Overy Street. And uh, typically it was open Mondays and Wednesdays for local pantries and um, anyone that wished to donate um, and some of our, our partner donor, donors to come Monday and Wednesday morning. And, um, you know, it's, it, was prim primarily operated by uh, about one and a half FTEs and a uh, large number of volunteers. What's an FTE? Uh, excuse me, a full-time uh, equivalent staff person. I so, see. Um, one and a half people, one in a one full-time and one part-time person, and a large number of volunteers. And uh, most of the volunteers um, are elders. So when um, the crisis was at peak. We lost most of our volunteers. Sure. Um, so one of the other things that happened was we have um, uh, energy auditors for our energy conservation program, and um, initially they go out to the house, you know, do an assessment on the home, 
um, at the beginning of COVID, um, we weren't allowed to go in homes um, except for dire emergency situations where someone's heating system was um, inoperable. Um, so we pivoted and had those energy conservation folks help out in the food warehouse. Um, oh my gosh, so <laughs> how many employees are there all told? Uh, we have about 200 employees and it's, wow. it's remained pretty stable. Um, you know, we did uh, implement a vaccine mandate. So we did have some um, staff people that, um, you know, that left, but um, we welcomed others. So um, it's, it's been an adjustment, but we feel like we're, we've come out the other side. Uh, on the fuel assistance side, um, the state was uh, supportive uh, in the sense that all uh, first time households um, after the first year of the uh, COVID crisis, um, the state assisted in uh, devising a software that clients could apply online for the first time ever in the history of the program. Um, we still have clients that don't feel comfortable applying online. There's also, um, right. I'm sure, situations where not everyone has a computer. Right. And then, of course, we were doing hybrid learning, so we were sharing mm -hmm. computers. And all this time, your employees are maybe dealing with that in their home situations mm -hmm. and then coming to work and, you know, dealing with vaccines and, and PPE. Yes. And then maybe your job is different that mm -hmm. day, something that you're trained for and used to and that you essentially signed up for. Now you're doing something different. different. How did you deal with just the employee morale? I mean, when we talk about, you know, first line people mm -hmm. and really folks that, um, you know, ha have a sense of emergency service, whether it's fuel assistance or otherwise, we don't always think of your organization, but there are so many elements of that. Right. Um, I think, you know, it was a team effort. Every, everybody pitched in uh, where it was needed. And um, it's not, uh, you know, remote really wasn't a big part of it. Um, so not too much of an option when too someone's much of an option. heat is out and right. you've got to, or they're, you know, maybe they have a breathing machine and, you know, their, their power's out. Wow. So you've got to, you've got to do it. Right. Right. Um, you know, we also, for people that weren't comfortable doing an application online, um, you know, we did telephone intakes and, uh, one of the other things that happened is, um, you know, resources uh, became available to do more emergency rents and mortgages. Um, you know, we also provide the VITA program, volunteer income tax assistance. Sure. And I um, did that back in the day. I volunteered oh, to help people yeah. with um, tests. It's, you know, it's something that people really appreciate and right. it, it helps out the community in general. So we pivoted that to remote as well. Wow. So people could drop their uh, information off in a secure mailbox and um, we had the uh, the volunteers come into the office and um, you know do the taxes contact people by phone so it's like you you figure it out um, how how did that you know kind of um, mix with your partners for example you know the the referral services that you work with and mm -hmm. the and the folks that you refer out from right. you? Well, we have, uh, for example, in fuel assistance, we have 56 um, volunteer sites that take applications for us, uh, primarily councils on aging. Um, some of the councils on aging did, did um, close down or go remote, but um, they still participated in the, in the um, intake as they could, whether it was by phone um, or whether they did have um, a couple of folks in the office. So, uh, you know, our partners stuck with us. Um, you know, we have um, 120 oil dealers, propane dealers, coal, firewood, everything. Uh, weatherization contractors. 
right. the heating system contractors. So everybody had to implement, you know, uh, adapt to PPE and and implement, um, wow. you know, safety measures, uh, social distancing. But um, you know, again, it, it was a team effort. But I think we're hopefully through the other side. I I feel like this segment is becoming about unsung heroes. The um, one aspect of which um, your website talks about the fact that you're accredited by the National Academy of Early Childhood Programs, a division of the National Association for the Education of Young Children, and of course have being um, one of the lead sponsors of CommonStartMA.org. It's a very high priority not only for the future of our children, but to get families, and particularly women, back to work, and then, then to support uh, folks who are in child care as a career and, and business owners. Can you speak to um, the effect and, and maybe um, where you're going in terms of the Council's early uh, child uh, care offerings? Yes, we have, um, we have early Head Start, which is uh, ages three months to up to three. Uh, we provide regular head start, head start, so to speak, and that's for children ages three to five. Um, and we, a quick second on Head Start. Is that a program that, for example, pediatricians might refer particular children to, or how, how do you qualify for Head Start? It is, uh, head Start is an in income-based eligibility, but there are also um, other opportunities for um, eligibility. This year, um, HHS uh, just instituted categorical eligibility for households on SNAP. Um, so I believe that took effect at the end of April. Um, in addition to that, uh, households with children that have disabilities, um, there's a, a certain percent of households that uh, regardless of income, uh, based on the disability, the child might be eligible for Head Start. Because um, just in case folks who are watching, they may, you know, they may want to think of you. Not that mm -hmm. you're not busy enough. Mm -hmm. um, but it, and and how do you how do you see the programs moving forward? Well, um, th we're enrolling right now for the fall, wow. so um, there are other uh, there's subsidized child care. Um, through the Commonwealth. We um, have some children that are Head Start eligible that might also be eligible for uh, care beyond the hours of Head Start through um, subsidies. Um, there are certain, um, we assist households that might be homeless mm -hmm. um, with slots. Um, so there's a variety of child care options. The best thing for people to do is to call the 508-746-0333 uh, number and talk to an intake worker because they, they know all the ins and outs in terms of eligibility for child care services. That's, that's huge and I, I'm glad you, uh, you just put the number out there. That's going to be really helpful. Just as we wrap up, I want to give you an opportunity because there's such a wide amount of services and uh, it's inc really incredibly impressive that you were able to continue to do as much as you did during COVID. What would you say is the most important thing you would like folks to know about the organization? And what would you say might be the best role for me as a legislator in continuing to partner with your work? Well, you've been most helpful to us already, and we certainly um, don't hesitate to reach out when there's um, a priority that we feel is important to our clients and families on the South Shore and the Cape. Um, I think uh, if people know themselves that they're in need of assistance, uh, even if they've never needed assistance in the past. Um, please turn to our website. It's www.sscac.org. 
Uh, we're very excited. We're on the verge of rolling out a very new website, hopefully in the very near future. And um, I think it's much more, it'll be much more user friendly and the graphics are, are, um, are look, look better. Um, and hopefully people will find it uh, very helpful. That, that's great. It's amazing to be able to do that with all else you have going on. Thank you for taking the time to join us, Lisa. I really appreciate it. And for anyone who might want to know more about the South Shore Community Action Council, please check out their website for all the incredible things that they do. Now, switching gears, in consideration of the budget, I always pay the closest attention to the programs and services that make a difference in the communities I represent. So it's helpful to hear from those doing the work locally as the deliberations continue. I would encourage you to follow my Facebook and Twitter pages for more updates. If you have any questions about the budget or any other pertinent issue for that matter, please do not hesitate to reach out to my office by calling 617-722-1330 or emailing susan.moran at masenate.gov. Thank you all for watching today. I'm Senator Moran and I'll be in your corner.